design a machine learning model. In this section, we shall learn more concepts from machine learning and implement a powerful model. In this video lecture, the intuition behind random forest algorithm, we learn the basic foundations of decision trees, random forests, bagging, and regression trees. We simplify the mathematics involved and touch many topics such as probability, statistics, information theory, and machine learning. Before we get started, don't be intimidated by the mathematical formulas as you don't have to memorize them at all, but you will need to have a strong feeling of what they roughly mean. By the end of this lecture, you should be able to pick up any scientific research paper and read it quite easily. This video lecture starts by explaining the reasons why decision trees are favored over other machine learning algorithms. Then we explain the difference between bias and variance, which is a favorite interview question for almost every data science job. We also explain the advanced technique of ensemble learning. Then finally reach our goal of how random forests work and how to apply them for regression analysis. Let's start with decision trees. The decision tree is a classic tool for rule-based inference. For example, the tree we have on the screen models a fruit classifier. It begins by asking of the color of the fruit object. And based on the answer, it branches out to different questions. If the fruit object is green, so it asks again of the object's size. If it's a large green fruit object, then it's more likely to be a watermelon. Decision trees are favored over many other machine learning models because it's easy to explain why the model has arrived at a certain conclusion. Decision trees are among the fastest models for both classification and regression, since a logarithmic number of steps is required for inference. Unlike other machine learning models, it can be trained with little data. However, one should be careful since decision trees can easily produce overfitted solutions. That means solutions that fail to generalize well to new data samples which they were not trained on. In the next few slides, I will explain how decision trees are trained. A learning algorithm for decision trees should meet a specific criteria by answering the following questions. The first couple of questions are concerned with the type of data. There are binary data, categorical data, and numerical data. In the case of binary data, only two values are allowed, which is simply yes or no. In the case of categorical data, multiple nominal values are allowed. For example, if the feature examined is the color, then the answer could be either red, green, or blue, and so on. In the case of decision trees, numerical data is usually handled by splitting the range into periods. For example, if the feature values range from 0 to 10, then values between 1 to 3 will direct the execution to the left path, and so on for the rest of the periods they will redirect the execution to the other paths. The next question is concerned with the branching factor, which is sometimes called the branching ratio. It's a common concept in trees. The branching factor is the cardinality of the outgoing nodes, or in other words, simply, how many branches are allowed to descend from each node. Deciding which feature should be at the root node and which feature should be at the subsequent nodes is a big question in decision trees. And this is where information theory kicks in. Information theory was founded by Shannon in the 1940s. It wasn't till the 1990s when Quenon et al. introduced the concept of information-based decision trees. The literature has grown a lot ever since. The equation on the screen right now represents 
information entropy. For a given message M, information entropy is a measure of how much information exists in a certain message. Information entropy is measured in bits. It is the sum of the product of the probability and the logarithm of the probability of every part of the message. So back to our goal at a given node, we want to choose the feature that holds more information, or in other words, that best clusters the data set. In order to achieve this, we introduce the concept of information impurity, which simply means splitting the data in a way that minimizes the classes in each split. So we choose the feature that yields more samples belonging to the same class in each branch. Gini impurity is another measure of impurity at a given node, which takes variance into account. Misclassification impurity aims at minimizing the probability that a sample is wrongly classified. The equation is inversed, since any probability is equal to 1, so the minimum probability of a wrong classification is equal to 1 minus the maximum probability of a correct classification. Now let's do some reasoning of which impurity function is the best. We can see that the red line has a very strong peak in the middle, which means the line of 50-50 equal class probability. So now remains the entropy impurity and the Gini impurity. So we can see from the graph that the Gini impurity, the dashed line, is sharper towards the peak than the solid line. That's why the Gini impurity is favorable in feature selection in decision trees. And now for the sake of completeness, it's worth talking a bit about the decision function, which is derived from whichever impurity measure we are going to use. The equation is a function that is calculated at every node by subtracting the impurity at the left and right children of that node from its own impurity. The result is the desired delta impurity value at that node. Now let's move to another question that the learning algorithm has to address. Leaf nodes are the ones at the very last levels of the tree and they have no more children. Declaring a leaf node is again based on impurity, so we choose the one that as much as possible allows all samples to have the same label, that is, the most pure node. Following the same fashion explained, if no pure node is found, the algorithm should continue splitting forever. So we need a mechanism to instruct the algorithm to stop. Some ideas involve setting a threshold on the impurity or a threshold on the split size. It's very tiring to find such an optimal threshold. The chi-square test is based on the null hypothesis that the algorithm should stop if a given split is no better than a random split. So if the result is either zero or below a given threshold, usually named the confidence level, then the split is as bad as a coin toss or a random split. Otherwise, the null hypothesis is rejected and the algorithm continues. So the tree can still grow to be very deep or even grow to be highly imbalanced. So a technique named pruning is used to trim the tree by merging redundant nodes after the training is complete. So it means from our previous discussion that a leaf node may be impure and have two or more classes. But this is not a big deal, since the node will predict according to the majority voting of the class probabilities at that node. Another issue is how to handle missing values. And there are two remarkable techniques for this problem, and they differ in their computational complexity. Surrogate splits makes copies of the nodes and chooses other features that don't suffer missing values within the same range at the same level. 
while the other technique simply follows all paths to make its final inference. Now in order to drive this discussion home, remains to explore the runtime and space requirements of the learning algorithm. The training involves sorting the values at each node, which can be done in n log n time. This is multiplied by n, which is the number of nodes, multiplied by d, which is the number of features. So the training is quadratic at best. The inference, however, is very fast since only one path of the tree should be traversed and this is always logarithmic. The storage requirements is linear which makes the resulting model very lightweight and portable. There are four common algorithms in the literature. The oldest of them is ID3 but it fails on numerical data. So C4.5 and C5 algorithms address this limitation by allowing numerical values. Finally, there is CART method, which takes it further and allows decision trees to be used in regression analysis. CART method is used by scikit-learn library, which is the ML or machine learning library we are using in this course. Let's continue our discussion of bias and variance. Bias means that the model is not learning enough about the data due to its low capacity. So we usually solve the problem by increasing the model capacity, size, and parameters. Bias also means that the model fails on the training data. Bias is another word for underfitting. Variance, on the other hand, means that the model has learned its training data very well, but it fails, however, to generalize well to new data that it wasn't trained on. Variance is another word for overfitting. What we desire is low bias and low variance. Bias and variance are mostly inversely proportional, except in the optimal global minima, where both are minimum. The total error is the sum of both bias and variance. Here you are a general formula that represents bias, variance, and noise. You will become familiar with this notation since error is usually the square of the difference between the ground truth y and the prediction response y bar. Sometimes y bar is annotated as f of x. Don't memorize the equation, but try to let it sink down your mind and give it enough thought. Now it's time for one of the most interesting and most often used concepts in machine learning, which is ensemble learning. It consists of two main ideas, bagging and boosting. In this section, we focus on bagging, and in section 4, we focus on posting. Bagging is a short term for bootstrap aggregation. In statistics, bootstrap means sampling a subset of the data set. The idea is to enhance the performance and reduce overfitting. This can be done by training many models and then averaging their inference in a majority voting fashion. First, the data set is split into n subsets where N stands for the desired number of models to be trained. The next step is to train each model individually on only a subset of the total dataset. Finally, the result is the average of the model votes. If you remember in the beginning of this video lecture, I have said that the decision trees are more prone to overfitting than other algorithms. That's why this technique is used to reduce overfitting. Another common concept in bagging is the evaluation metric, which is called out-of-bag score. It simply means evaluating the performance of a given tree by testing it on the remaining n-1 datasets. These n-1 datasets are the ones that were used for training the other estimators. The idea is to use new unseen samples and you will find it in many ML libraries documentations. Another advantage of bagging is that the estimators can be trained in parallel using a cloud of servers. This is very handy when facing problems at a large scale. So the previous discussion should have laid down the ground and made your brain ready to absorb random forests in an eye blink. Random forests, as the name suggests, are a bagging of many decision trees. 
This way we get better results than using just a single tree. However, it has one more distinct characteristic over bagging. Random forests don't only sample subsets of the dataset, but also sample subsets of the features and let each model train on a different set of features. As a consequence, we can use random forests as a way of measuring features importance. For example, in one of my previous projects, we had a set of 250 features and we used random forests to calculate feature importance, then used only the top percentile of the features for training another model. This trick might help you in your career one day, so keep it on mind. Another nifty trick that was proving useful is to use random forests to sort the features by their importance and then use the top percentile of the features to train another random forest model that is specialized in inference. Such pipelines of models for data pre-processing, feature engineering and inference are often used in ML competitions and in the industry as well. In the context of algorithmic trading, we are mainly concerned with regression rather than classification. Regression simply means prediction of future values. For example, we know from the previous section that we have the dataset of the open, close, low and high prices of a given stock share. So we can use these values in order to forecast the future value. Regression is a common well-established concept in statistics. In this graph, you can see that there are red data points, which represents the available data set. The goal of regression is to find a line or a hyperplane that best describes the observed pattern. The mathematics is simply using the known x and y values to predict the coefficients of the function. In case of linear functions, this is the slope and the intercept. The first equation here on the screen is a general equation for predicting the coefficients of a hyperplane given the values for n features such as x1, x2 up to xn. The next equation is the error function that is solved analytically to find the coefficients for the fitted line or plane. The error again is the square of the def the error again is the square of the deviation of the prediction from the ground truth and it is summed over all available dataset points from i equals 0 to n. The trees used for regression are almost the same like the ones used for classification, since the CART method for learning allows training regression trees. The error function is calculated based on the error in the left and right branches of a given node.